Our next session will focus on a topic or set of topics uh, that the Chamber has been advocating for over the past three plus years. Uh, many of you will recall that we published a national action plan for blockchain in early 2019. Uh, in this document, we laid out several guiding principles for the government to consider uh, when thinking about a coordinated pro-growth approach to blockchain and digital assets. Fast forward to 2022, many of the ideas that we proposed in that document um, were included in the executive order signed by President Biden in March. So we have a great panel here to break down that executive order for you. Uh, I'd like to now introduce our moderator, Maggie Lake from Real Vision, who will introduce our panelists. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I want to echo the comments that it is fantastic to be here with you all live, in person, gathered in one room. And we really are off to a, uh, an amazing start. That was a great conversation. And we're going to pick up on the last part of that and talk about the executive order. But first, let's introduce our panelists here this morning. Uh, starting from, um, I don't know if I'm going to go in order, but I'm going to start with Perry M. Boring, <laughs> CEO and founder of the Chamber of Digital Commerce. I'm sure many of these folks are known to all of you. Uh, Richard Rosenthal, U.S. Banking Advisory Leader, Blockchain and Digital Assets for Deloitte. Uh, Kathy Craninger, VP of Regulatory Affairs at Solidus Labs. And Raj Mukherjee, Global Head of Tax at Binance. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So... <clears throat> Perianna, I'd like to start with you, and let's just pick up on that conversation. Uh, and we just heard, you know, Commissioner Romero talk about how important she felt the executive order was. You know, in your mind, why, why is this? Why is it so important? What do we need to understand about it? Yeah, and I brought a quote from President Biden. Uh, this is from the executive order. I'm going to shorten it just a bit, but he says, we must reinforce the United States leadership in the development of digital assets. I don't know what more we need to say to uh, get a validation of the critical role blockchains are going to play in our economy. Why the executive order was needed and why at the last DC blockchain summit, which wasn't, <laughs> it's been a couple of years, in 2019, we introduced our national action plan for blockchain, which called for an EO and set forward the principles to build this EO. Um, but we had felt very strongly that this was needed for a couple of reasons. One, we have a very complex stakeholder map. The United States has a very fragmented regulatory environment. We just heard from the SEC and the CFTC, but there's many more agencies involved. We have FinCEN from an anti-money laundering perspective. You have two different consumer regulators, the CFPB, we have Kathy here who used to serve there, um, as well as the FTC. You have DOJ's involvement. Uh, you also have Congress. There's 42 bills pending in, in Congress today. And then the states also have a purview over digital assets. So for businesses that have to navigate this incredibly complex regulatory landscape, there's a lot of red tape and it's holding back businesses' involvement in building and developing their businesses here in the United States. So that's one. And the second one we also picked up in our fireside chat we had just now um, in that there has been this enforcement for first yeah. tone. And that sends a very specific message to the industry, which is beware. And particularly at the SEC, we have a lot of uh, questions about where their jurisdiction begins and where it ends. And because we do not have a regulatory framework, businesses have to guess. And if you guess wrong, they're going to come after you. So that's the message we've seen. The market has been given over and over and over and over again. So to have President Biden come out and say, no, we must be a leader, I think it completely changes the tone. And it makes very clear to the agencies and it directs them to ensure that businesses can thrive and it sets forward the path to finally get that regulatory framework. So we're hopeful we'll get the regu cl regulatory clarity that we need for businesses to build here in the U.S. Mm. Kathy, I'm interested to get your perspective as somebody who did work at an agency. You know, we, we, we heard that, you know, okay, this is the announcement and now it's the regulatory review. What does it mean for 
the folks tasked with that to have that EO out there? Uh, it, is, it is absolutely a massive undertaking, and certainly for the reasons that Perry Ann noted, it was critical for our industry, critical for, for setting a, a macro framework and the policy direction of the country. Um, I, it should not be underestimated, particularly when you look at the U.S. role across the globe. So many countries were way ahead of us in terms of actually putting out digital economy direction, policy statements, frameworks, five-year plans, and the U.S. really had not done that. You've got, again, a proliferation of different agencies seeking to do slightly different things along the way at the state level, at the federal level. And really, again, the president's statement, which noted all of the policy um, just initiatives, efforts, and direction for the U.S. government to say, look, we have a lot of different policy goals. Let's write them down. Let's think about them. Let's balance and talk about them, whether, again, it's investor protection, it's U.S. competitiveness uh, in the global economy, it is our national security interests, countering crime. So putting all of that in writing is something that should not be underestimated in terms of how important it is to move the government in a direction. Um, at the same time, as you noted, uh, a ton of work. These are all reports. I've heard a lot of people talking about in the executive order as if it is regulation or actually provides some change in the legislative direction or, or issues regulation. It does not do that. Uh, it is really the opportunity to get the bureaucratic apparatus working together to think about the policy issues that need to be faced, opportunities and risks in one place, and moving forward with those things. And uh, yes, it is a ton of work. Uh, I know so many of you are all you know, talking to who across the government is involved in these working groups and, and lots of rumors around what direction it's going to go. But I just see it as very positive that you've got that energy and activity behind it. There's still a ton more work to do uh, across the board. Yeah, DC complex. <laughs> we, we know that to be the case. Um, Richard, it does t touch on a range of options, uh, but you're talking to a lot of the entrepreneurs and, and your clients will be affected by this. Um, what, what's top of mind for them? And I think the the, the global competitiveness part is really important because if we don't sort it out, you know, this is a, a, a talent war across the globe. A lot of these entrepreneurs can pick up and go someplace else. Yeah. And, and I think as, as Kathy mentioned, it's not necessarily regulation yet. And it has, a, I think, a very constructive tone in terms of balancing, you know, competition and commerce with safety and soundness. Uh, what they're really looking for is clarity and certainty. I mean, you know, our, our clients are looking at how do I engage with this technology? Um, I, think, I, I think most people in this room and a lot of people are coming to the recognition that there's a replatforming of financial services uh, and other industries with you know, digital assets plus blockchain. And, and folks want to launch products. They want to engage customers. They want to use the products and services. And I think when they go through that process, they struggle with a little bit. Can I do this? How far can I go? How do I adapt AML regs? Um, what do I have to do around disclosures? Um, is this a security? Um, and so, you know, we are in that uh, law firms, consulting firms, and a bunch of others are trying to help navigate what that looks like. And I think, to Kathy's point and Perry Ann's point, is if they can provide that framework of foundation and we can build some momentum on the back of that, you know, I think it's, it's a start. We've got to keep going because the reports are just reports. Um, the other word I would throw out there, it's a little bit of an accountability framework. Because if the agencies have to deliver reports, they've got deadlines and, and to-dos. But I think we do need, um, we need to see that through. Because I don't think it's enough if we get the reports. And, and I still think some of the clients are going to be like, well, can I do this? Can I not do this? Raj, the word foundation is interesting. Um, we have a lot of issues that need to move forward. Are there priorities? Do you feel that there are some issues that need to be addressed as the foundation for everything else to be built on? Yeah, I think I'll echo something that Richard said, which is I'm on the other side of where he is, right? I'm, I'm the client. Um, you know, Binance US is a regulated exchange, and on a day-to-day -day perspective, part of my job is to provide directives to internal businesses when they come to me and say, well, here's the ideation of the product. I want to take it to market tomorrow. What are the regu regulatory frameworks? And for a long time, I think, you know, we didn't have that. We had certain things from the SEC, the IRS, but, but this, on the positive side, is the first 
I would say, complete beginnings of an architecture, but the challenges still remain, right? We talked about the reports. Well, the reports will probably lead to something else. What do I do in the meantime, right? I, I have customers, I have uh, businesses, I have things that need to be pragmatically delivered. So that's the one thing. I think, um, as Richard mentioned, it's a, it's a long game. Um, I think it's gonna take a while uh, before we, we get full clarity on what the regulatory framework's gonna look like. I think, but at the same time, the priority is something we heard in the previous panel, which is responsible innovation. I think it is important to do the right due diligence before issuance of coins in the market, for example. Um, I think the customer protection uh, and the customer interest uh, needs to be taken into account. Um, and I think the other thing that is interesting uh, to me from a sort of a private sector perspective is, so a lot of the agencies that are named in this report are not traditionally agencies that have been involved in the digital asset space in the last five years, you know, the EPA, commerce, et cetera. Not, say, not saying that they're not gonna be useful, but um, you know, we, education is an ongoing moving target in the blockchain space, right? We find that every day. I'm learning myself and I've been doing this for five years, right? Um, so I empathize with the challenges of the folks in these agencies who now have to sort of go out there, learn this technology, keep up with the tremendously fast pace of innovation, and then come up with recommendations. So I think those are some of the main challenges. Yeah, perry I think this speaks you know, exactly to what I know the, that the chamber is trying to work on. I mean, this is exponential, the speed of this. Even for people steeped in it, the learning curve is enormous. It's so rapid. And this isn't usually, as I joked a minute ago, the way Washington works. Well, I mean, we've been at this for eight years, and I feel like we're still just getting started in terms of the need of education across our policy community. And Raj makes a really good point about the EO, and it's that there's a bunch of agencies who really haven't been at a part of the conversation that are now that now are because they were listed in the executive order, whether that's the EPA with the climate questions or uh, the US Department of Commerce who's overseeing global economic competitiveness. But when we talk about crypto in this town, a lot of people think financial innovation, but we are rebuilding the internet, a peer-to-peer -peer internet, and that is gonna impact every area of our economy, very similar to how the internet itself completely changed the way that we share information and the way government works and the way businesses work, blockchains are gonna do the same thing. And I strongly believe that if Washington is able to get this right, if they're able to build a regulatory framework that supports businesses developing and innovating here in the United States, we will see an economic boom in this country like we haven't seen in decades, something akin to what we saw to the internet boom or the economic growth we saw in the 1920s. It's that powerful and it's that key that we get this right. We have a long way to go. When I testified in the Senate Ag, Ag Committee just a couple of months ago, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried, the CEO of FTX, shared some data about what's actually happening in the, in the crypto economy. And he said over 90% of trading volumes is happening outside of the US. Yet, the majority, the mass majority of intellectual property, so the development from our technical community that's going into building these innovations, that's coming from US people. So just think about that for a minute. How disappointing and how much of a problem is it that we have the American innovation economy putting a huge amount of time and resources and make up the majority of this ecosystem, yet it's all happening overseas. How did we get this so wrong to begin with? How did we push so much innovation, so much economic activity elsewhere? We need to bring that back if the US wants to remain at the forefront of technical and financial leadership. Mm. Richard, I was struck in the conversation with the commissioners about the, the back and forth between, or around rather, public comment. Uh, is there enough input from the private sector in these conversations? How critical should that be, given the pace of change we're seeing in innovation? Um, should they have a, more of a voice or a seat at the table when we're trying to uh, figure out the fastest way to provide clarity? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And I think one of the challenges we're gonna have with the EO is I think there's like, 12, 13, 14, 15 reports, and they come out in a fairly uh, condensed fashion. So I worry a little bit about the ability to read, digest, and provide feedback. We have a couple, we have a, in September, I think, a number of reports coming out. 
I, I think the regulators in, in, uh, do take those comment letters uh, seriously. Um, and there are a range of, of part market participants that need a way in. I mean, that's the whole purpose. I mean, I think well-formed arguments, uh, you know, providing perspectives, and, and that is part of the process, and we need to see transparency in how those comments are addressed. So I think one, one of the call to actions is, I think the community needs to lean in and read and absorb and, and, and provide feedback, because ultimately that's gonna be you know, part of the process, that will, at least one part. Mm. Kathy, you've had the challenge and experience of working in government interagency and trying to sort of build that cooperation. Uh, certainly, the commissioners here striking a very hopeful note about a, a different kind of environment where we will see that. Uh, do you share that confidence and what can be done to help so that all of these various reports and agencies are working together and not it doesn't get too fragmented. I think it's the important thing is, is what Perry Ann laid out as the starting point here. Realizing that blockchain is absolutely the, the future iteration of the internet. And you look back in the early 90s, who had the vision, uh, maybe besides Jeff Bezos, with respect to where e-commerce was going to go, what social media would, would involve, and, and how our lives would fundamentally change. So it's not just the economy, it's our society, it's everything about it. And, and blockchain has that potentiality. So the, the other thing I would note on this too is, I don't know that we've come to a settling place with respect to how the internet is regulated, or exactly how it should be regulated. So the notion that we're gonna solve everything for blockchain or for digital assets through this executive order, or through anything else, you know, I, that's a lot of expectation uh, that we'll be disappointed. But, but it is really this education process of talking about these issues, understanding the potential that is being unlocked here, and the fact that it's a constant learning um, opportunity, frankly, as, as Raj said, this is gonna be an ongoing process. Um, traditional finance, too. You know, the, these, the, there are still fraud, manipulation, scams happening every day. Uh, telecom, same thing. I mean, you look at the vulnerable populations, so we have a lot of work to do in general around a lot of things as an industry. So I, I think the government conversation is important. Uh, engaging, as Richard noted, is important. But we also have to have an industry conversation and frankly help call out, and I know you're gonna jump to, to Terra Luna too, but call out those that are actually you know, bringing the industry down and are not actually acting um, the way you should to help this industry grow and grow with integrity. Yeah, Raj, I'd love for you to pick up on that. And there's going to be a whole session on stablecoin later, which I think we're all going to be really interested to hear. But, you know, it, it's that kind of um, headline, you know, backlash it, that doesn't help the conversation, especially when we're talking about trying to balance uh, enforcement with innovation. And then you have something like that happen. Roll in a lack of education, maybe understanding of what's really going on. Um, you know, headlines matter. And you know, that's got to sort of complicate, I would think, the process. What's the industry role here? What more can be done? Yeah, look, I mean, I think we have to be honest with ourselves that innovation will always include some level of risk. Um, you know, if you look at the stock market, you know, we have crashes in the stock market too, right? Um, anybody right here real, uh, understands that because of what we've been going through, right? <laughs> Little volatility, everyone's investments. Fair we feel the risk. Of All right. <laughs> But, but, I think that, but I think that this is where sort of having some level of sort of responsible due diligence and, and thinking about you know, how the consumer protection and the, the consumer confidence aspect of really issuing new coins or, or, or bringing an idea to market matters, right? Because at the end of the day, this industry is only about just north of a decade old, right? Um, there are going to be some failures. There's going to be, I believe firmly that there's going to be more positives than not. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is a learning process. There are going to be some curves along the way. I think, um, you know, much, much like I say that the term cryptocurrency was the worst 
worst thing we did to, to this industry, because it's neither cryptic nor a currency, right? Um, I think stable coins, is it really stable? I don't know, maybe we can find a different way of, of, of saying the same thing. Uh, but I think that it is important to have these various types of assets in, in, in the industry. It is important to educate consumers. Um, I think it's a role of, you know, amazing trade associations like the, like the Chamber, as well as, I think, you know, um, those of us that are involved on the exchange side, you know, should have resources, um, you know, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to be a learning curve, but I think that should not, in turn, stop the innovation. I think, I think headlines shouldn't really stop innovation, and headlines shouldn't, in my opinion, um, rush uh, prohibitive legislation. I think legislation should be scaled to fit. It should be evolutionary, just as the industry is evolving. Um, and yeah, to some extent, it's going to be three steps forward and maybe a step and a half back. Uh, but I think that's the natural course. I just want to stay with you, Raj, because you're, you come from the traditional finance yep. background. Are there sort of lessons to be learned, or, or, or is it wrong to try to apply those rules to such a new and different industry. You know, you, 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 I think your point is great about what we call these things. Is it really a currency? Is it a, you know, it, sometimes it feels like we're trying to put on the traditional finance regulatory framework on something that's very different and, and, a, and a topic that's much broader. Well, I think there's some truth to that, but I, you know, I, I like to think of it in, in two separate ways. I think there are aspects of this industry that are nothing like we've ever seen before. Um, DeFi, you know, uh, smart contracts, things like that. But there are the other more familiar side of what I call, you know, in my mind, you know, uh, sort of traditional crypto, right? Um, which behave like assets that we, we can sort of look at parallel assets in the traditional financial industry and say, okay, does this behave like a commodity? Does it behave like, you know, indistinguished property? Does it behave like security? Um, and I think, I think the learning curve and the way to look at these things is, is not linear, right? I think we should have to look at uh, the various buckets of, of what these uh, different areas of the industry look like and then kind of make an effort to understand the low-hanging fruits first and then go and, and figure out, okay, are we trying to you know, put a square peg in a round hole when it comes to certain things like DeFi and smart contracts? So I don't think it's a, it's a one-size-fits-all. I think I know... Uh, Perry and the Chamber's been doing a lot to try to help on the education front. It's, it's interesting because as we all struggle with this and as the politicians are going to struggle with it, consumers are sort of voting with their feet. And we saw uh, Representative Soto talking about it. We've seen mayors in major cities um, rush to respond to their constituents who want those jobs, who want those industries, who are participating in this. Yeah, look, I, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies a lot of times people make the mistake. We see them you know, on CNBC, the tickers, and then you have Bitcoin and Ether up there now. Um, a lot of people are looking at these like a stock. Um, that, that's a mistake because they're not companies. Bitcoin doesn't have a CEO. It's a network. And the way we measure and value a network is very different than how we measure companies. Uh, networks uh, follow what's called an S-curve adoption. We are on an S-curve for cryptocurrencies. In the executive order, it stated that we're about 25% adoption today. About 25% of U.S. households own some form of cryptocurrency today. Um, based on a number of surveys and studies years before, we, we estimate we were at 10% adoption in 2019. So that puts us at 90% adoption by 2029. So just think about that. In 2029, it's estimated that 90% of U.S. households will own some form of cryptocurrency. And there's no putting this back in the bag. Regulators can try to slow it down by you know, dragging their feet on giving clarity and uh, you know, kind of preventing institutions from entering this space in a meaningful way. But these adoption and networks effects have already taken place. And so government is a reflection of its people. And at the end of the day, this is happening, and it's time for Washington to get on board and accept that, uh, because one, there's a lot to lose if we don't get it right. Uh, but two, uh, this is the will of the people, and that needs to be acknowledged in the way we look at this from a policy perspective. Everybody's talking about the midterm elections we'll see later this year. Um, we're getting so many inquiries from people who are running for office all around the country who are running on a pro-Bitcoin, 
pro-crypto platform we're supporting those candidates. Uh, and I think we will start to see more representation in Congress, as well as the people who work throughout our policymaking community who want to see this industry um, be met with smart policy. Mm. And Richard, you know, this isn't, I think it is very easy to continue to come back to this being about crypto, but blockchain is going to influence so many industries. I mean, every company is really a tech company now, no matter what they're in. Um, I know you work with clients across the board. We talk a lot about the potential, what can be lost, what can be gained if they get this right. If we start to fill in that conversation, um, what does the carrot look like? Yeah, I mean, I, there's so many use cases that are really exciting. I mean, what it can do around ownership and identity I was just thinking about the DMV and the title process and, you know, going there, how long it will take maybe the states to, uh, to, to adopt blockchain. But, you know, you can basically apply it to any of your use cases in your life um, and start to say there's an immutable record, there's ownership, um, there's a lot of things we can do. We haven't even talked about Web3 and the metaverse, um, NFTs, uh, DeFi. So there's, there's just so many use cases. And I think part of the challenge is the um, you know education immersion and training. There's like I think I think w one of the things I think you're hearing from all of us is that it's a bit of an overwhelming conversation and you kind of need to lean in um, and engage and kind of uh, work through it. But uh, there's so much opportunity. I mean, it's really about uh, stepping back from the client picture. It's about U.S. competitiveness. It's a, I think Perry Ann you know laid out the right statistics in terms of this is about us leading and I think that's why we were all really excited about the tone in the executive order. Um, but you know companies aren't stopping. I mean when we get into conversations, we're having some really exciting conversations about the art of the possible. And so they might put it on the shelf and say we'll do it when the time's right, but they're doing the work, which I think is and that's kind of our advice a little bit too is. You can't ignore this any longer. You've got to lean in, engage, and, and apply it to your, uh, your industry. Kathy, I think your comment before was so spot on about the internet. Uh, you kind of feel like history could be repeating itself again, but maybe with more at stake because you know, we, the U.S. could lose out in a way that it didn't before if this moves offshore. Uh, what, are, what are the opportunities you see, and where can the private sector really plug in and push this along? Great question, and 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 I'm really even picking up off of what was just said. Uh, consumers are engaging with crypto. The the numbers that Perry Ann noted in terms of adoption and the and the progress in this country, and and again, given the nature of this network effect and the internet and Web 3.0, moving offshore doesn't actually protect U.S. citizens and, and folks in America from accessing this. They're going to access it. So that's the other dynamic that regulators have to realize is that pushing it away actually is, is really doubling down on the harm that can happen uh, to consumers because they want access to it and they're going to be able to access it. So it's whether they can access it in a regulated way, in a way that really is promoting growth and helping U.S. competitiveness uh, at the same time is I think one of, the, one of the key questions. And so the one thing I'd also note on, on regulatory clarity, we talk about it a lot as an industry. I, I actually think in some respects we've done ourselves a disservice because this is in fact a regulated industry. People didn't like to hear that, that's not the beginning of, of the industry's kind of ethos, but it is a regulated industry. The question is really the details and, and is it regulated the way regulators want it to be? Is it regulated the way the industry wants it to be? Can we get to that next level of nuance question? And I think that's where the industry really uh, can be helpful in coming together and saying, you know, yes, you, you want us to register. Okay, let's actually talk about what that means. Let's talk about the ATS application process and whether we can answer all of the questions that are required as a wicket process to get through. You know, let's actually talk about the granular issues on all of the SEC forms as to what, again, doesn't apply here. Uh, so I think those are the kinds of questions that industry really can help. Uh, regulators, I mean, I've, I've had this conversation with a number of commissioners, CFTC, SEC, you know, leadership uh, across the board, uh, on the Hill too. They're dying for these examples. They want to, to tangibly touch it and understand it. And yes, compare it to the framework they're operating from, which is all the traditional finance rules. So it's not about not having rules. You know, it's about, as, as Raj noted, 
the way our, our uh, financial services regulation system works, market participants actually decide which regime they're subject to as they build their business and decide you know, what kind of business they're engaged in. But there are very nuanced, detailed, nitty-gritty questions that need to get addressed and, and clarity that needs to be provided in those areas. And it's really industry giving those examples. If we could just put that myth to bed, like right here, right now, <laughs> Crypto is regulated, and if anyone sell, says elsewise, they're wrong. That what they're really saying is that the regulation is, is not to their liking, but we have a cacophony of regulations that apply to this space. So for here and now, moving forward. Well, that's, and that's an important <laughs> distinction. Yeah. Crypto is regulated. Feel Thank free you. to apply. <laughs> that's an important distinction. And Raj, I see you nodding your head to all of this. Finance US is a regulated exchange. I start, you know, Absolutely. I mean, um, we have responsibilities. But I think the other thing to, to note that, you know, all, all, other, all that the panelists pointed out is the wide scale adoption, right, of, of crypto. So I think consumers and how consumers are educated and, and have the guidance to comply is also important. So one of the things that, you know, in my world in tax that I always have to touch on is, you know, what's Treasury saying? What's the IRS saying? Now, we know that the IRS, for example, has had a checkbox on the 1040, right, for quite some time about whether you've traded crypto or not. Um, but I think that there needs to be, you know, more clarity, um, you know, sort of the, the, the apple before, before the whip, so to speak. Uh, and I think that's a little lost here. Um, I know that there have been regulations that have been worked on, but Again, you know, I, I have customers that come to me and say, look, I, what do I give to the, to the IRS? Like, why don't mm -hmm. you give me a 1099? Why don't you, you know, because I want to comply. Um, and so, you know, I think that aspect also needs to be paid attention to. Um, I think that it's, it's encouraging that the um, executive order does ask Treasury to look into some of these areas and, and provide guidance. Um, I hope those regulations come out soon, um, because I think um, the other thing, having worked in... The, the world of the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act back in the day, um, I, these things take a while for industry to be able to build the internal architecture, test it out, and, and, and have the ability to comply both from, the, from our perspective as a, as a regulated exchange, but also to provide the correct forms and the correct um, information to the customer so that they can uh, comply with their own tax obligations, right? So, um, so I think those things are very important. I think it's good to sort of begin to conclude our conversation about expectations, managing expectations, because for all of the comments that were made here, all I keep thinking about is how quickly this is moving. I mean, I was checking in yesterday to my hotel, and there was a 65-year-old fellow going to the Nationals game talking about his crypto wallet. I don't even know if he knew what he was... And, and the Sitting in the terrace. So, so, and he, the, the person who was kind enough, you may be in the audience, just said, listen, just hang on to it, don't sell it, give it to your grandchildren. Like clearly, you know, but, but there is, it's moving so quickly, the, this entire industry. I would say faster than the internet did. I mean, just by the basis of where we're at. And this has to happen quickly. How should we think about expectations versus reality? perry -Ann, let's start with you. Yeah, so we had our, our annual uh, strategy and leadership meeting yesterday. It's a private meeting with our executive committee and advisory board members, and we spent <laughs> quite a bit of time talking about expectations. Um, a lot of the directives of the executive order, these reports that are coming out, are likely, it, it's likely many of them will have recommendations that Congress needs to put forward. As someone who used to work in Congress, I can tell you that's going to be a multi-year process. So don't expect significant policy changes this year. This is going to take some time. Look, let's not make any mistake, despite all the agencies that are involved, I think it's very clear that the US Securities and Exchange Commission is the number one blocker to this industry having economic progress and bringing an economic boom in this country that we haven't seen in decades. We need a basic definition from the SEC of what is a digital asset security, what's in your jurisdiction, what's not. It's really not a complicated question to answer, but they've refused to give guidance, and they've done that. They've been dragging their feet on that for years. We need a spot crypto ETF. How do we have futures ETFs but not a spot Bitcoin ETF? It, it doesn't make sense, and it's also harming investors in an incredible way. We need clarity on custody. 
What are the rules around how businesses you know, custody this technology that's impacting institutional adoption in a major way? There's some things that the agencies like the SEC could do immediately, but they've refused to. Hopefully this executive order will put forward a process and bring Congress into that, but that's going to take longer than it should. Fantastic. Well, we're out of time, but thank you so much. Fantastic conversation, and I can't wait for the rest of the day.